The time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand. We're gonna keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise to get what we want. We got to organize. Greetings, all. Uh, wherever you are, evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are, greetings. So this is the Pantsilla Podcast. We are the All African People's Revolutionary Party. In case you were not aware, our objective for the All African People's Revolutionary Party is to have a unified socialist Africa under scientific socialism. We say this every week. If you haven't researched it at this point, please go do it now yeah. and then watch this episode. And if you are watching this live, go research what that means after the episode. <laughs> we have a very special episode as usual, but we do have a guest. So we have a special guest and Tyrion Lee is our special guest. And I personally have known Tiernan for so many years organizing in the Oregon chapter of the AAPRP. Tiernan has been not an ally, but an accomplice to the struggle for African liberation as long as I've known them. And this subject, we are addressing African and Asian solidarity. As far as I'm concerned, they are on the front lines of the struggle for African liberation. We're gonna leave this up to you if you want to enter yourself, your experience in terms of organizing for liberation in general, as well as how you have come to be an accomplice in a struggle for African liberation, how you've come to organize with the AAPRP, just however you wanna enter yourself in this struggle. Sure. Thank you all for having me. Really appreciate y'all. Um, again, like the, the party is always like family and kin to me. Um, I really started cutting my teeth on organizing when I moved to Oregon, like in 2013. I started off with like Palestinian solidarity work, and that's actually how I met Ajamu, um, who is now part of the California chapter and started the Oregon chapter. Um, and really, I, I would like to say that he's probably my ideological father um, and mentor. Um, a lot of the things that I learn and places to go research and teach myself and, you know, uh, study with other people, uh, he inspired that, the party inspired that, Jamila inspired that. So uh, I really have a lot to give to the party, um, whatever that looks like about my life, because the party has already given me so much, uh, including uh, ancestors and, and elders. So um, I was also organizing with uh, Portland Committee for Human Rights in the Philippines. Um, and that's where like, I really deepened my relationship with the other folks in the party and also like my own understanding of capitalism, imperialism and neocolonialism and these things too. So with the guidance of the party, the guidance of um, Anik Bayan, Gabriella, P. Chirp, um, I really feel like really lucky to have that kind of mentorship and information. And so it's now my life's work to continue to spread that information. I was talking to Evan earlier and mentioned that I identify as a Pan-Africanist because it's very clear to me that until Africa is free, nobody else around the world can be free. That scientifically research, whatever you wanna say about it, like that is very clear to me. And I know like I'm here to support that path, whatever it looks like for uh, the Af Africans that are fighting for liberation. So you have my utmost respect. I am very honored to be here and yeah, appreciate y'all. And before we move on to this wonderful episode, uh, we're going to honor a couple of our ancestors. Uh, I will talk about Mbuya Nahanda. Uh, I have talked about uh, briefly the accident I got into, and a dear elder comrade of ours, um, she actually named uh, my amputated leg Mbuya Nahanda, <laughs> Missouri. thank you. Uh, and so Mbuya Nahanda was a uh, anti-colonial revolutionary and she fought 
arm struggle, waged armed struggle against British imperialism and colonialism and the area we now know as Zimbabwe, that is where she was located. And uh, she was eventually beheaded by those forces. There has been recent news about uh, them trying to look for her head and have it returned, but we definitely want to honor um, this dear comrade in our struggle, dear elder and ancestor in our struggle, Mbuya Nahanda. And so we have our other revolutionary in the struggle that we honor, if you want to talk about that, Evan. Yes. Uh, so our other revolutionary ancestor is uh, Gaspar Yanga, who was uh, one of the leaders of the Maroon in what is now known as Mexico. And he fought, they fought off against the the Spanish uh, Spanish colonialism during the 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 16th century, and they're able to uh, keep the maroon and I feel that both Yanga and Buya Nahanda are great representatives of ancestors that we want to honor and follow up in their footsteps. And yes, we are our ancestors. Don't get that twisted. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> so last episode, we talked about uh, solidarity. We focused on Palestinian solidarity. And I know you intro yourself with uh, being part of that struggle for Palestinian liberation. So how did you come into that struggle? It was actually when I was taking a, a class at Sacramento City College on the Swana region, North, North Africa, um, Southwest Asia. And I didn't know anything about Palestine. And when I started to learn about it, um, it wasn't until after the class did our professor uh, divulge that he was Palestinian. And it wasn't until, uh, well, learning about it, it, it just blew my mind that there's so many people that could sit around and not even have this conversation that there was no information about like indigenous rights. There was no information being spread about like um, Pal Palestinian sovereignty, you know. And as I learned more and more, I realized that like that's what Israel is paying for is the the massive PR work that they're doing all over the globe to try to couch themselves as a haven or d democracy, which. You know, you can take one look at their utilities and see that that's that's not a thing. I'm always down for the underdog. I don't care if you're eight or you're 80. If you're right, you're right. And so um, as unpopular as it was at the time and, you know, again, our elders fought this, too. Um, I, I put on a kufia. So every time I leave the house, I have a kufia on and I've not taken it off. Um, maybe a couple of days, but in the last seven years, pretty much every day as a kafia. Every picture that you'll see of me, I wear a kafia for that reason. Yes, I, I can attest that is true. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> even, even got a little mini one to wear. Oh, nice. <laughs> You've also had a lot of organizing in the struggle for liberation in the Philippines. So how did you come to be involved in that? Um, I, I think it was, um, I went to my first May Day as a representative of Super Students United for Palestinian Equal Rights. And I had met the ND or National Democratic Movement for the Philippines, the ND orgs, um, Anik Bayan, Gabriela and Peter. And they just invited me. They were so friendly. They invited me to every single event. Um, I had multiple people coming up to me, like their solidarity was on pat right there. Like they invited me in, started doing political education with me. And I started to understand like, again, here's a, a set of folks that are fighting for uh, their liberation and nobody here in the US is talking about it. And as we come to understand imperialism's like grand ideology is to keep us very quiet or, um, uh, keep us from hearing the truth. So that became really important to me. Or it's still really important to me. Um, I even did some fact-finding missions and some exposure trips to the Philippines. 
and uh, was also working with ILPS, so the International League of People Struggles, it's a national, our international alliance. Um, and then I started meeting folks from all over the place and then putting together and understanding how these systems, institutions of neocolonialism and imperialism are affecting us globally. And so that's again, like how I got to the point where I understand that if we look at who is stealing all the resources and where most of that's coming from, Africa, so that's telling me like until Africa's free, nobody's free. Definitely with the ND movement, their analysis um, around liberation is that they're fighting for their liberation in order to support other people's liberation. And I find that is actually one of the most principled things that I see among like different organizations and things like that. When you talk about the African liberation struggle and how no one will be free without the liberation of Africa, have you run into any trouble. What do you mean? You're of Asian descent. How can you be Pan-Africanist? And then leading up to that with the Asian African solidarity movements and your coming of knowledge to that. So those are our two questions. And then I'm going to give it to Evan. Yeah, I think I, I, I don't think I get questioned a whole lot. I mean, I might get some looks like, you know, why do you care? Especially like when I'm talking to folks that identify as black as opposed to African, they're like, you yeah, know, what do you care? What, what is going on? Like they appreciate the solidarity, but I think they also are questioning like, well, is it black lives matter or is it like Africa's free or no one's free until Africa's free. And so I see this kind of like dichotomy, at least here in the U S where a lot of folks will respect that, you know, I'll wear something that says like Pan-African or something that like has Kwame Ture's face on it. And I see a lot of like folks um, resonate with that, but there is a, a very clear delineation of analysis between like, do folks identify as black or do folks identify as African? I was actually thinking a lot about where my solidarity with African folks come from. And it's not just like, my organizing work, it's always been part of my life and trying to figure out where does that come from. And I was doing a little bit more research on like Grace Lee Boggs and Yuri Kochiyama and Richard Aoki. One through line that I'm seeing is that we all, um, we're not necessarily like in the deep end with our own cultures, which I don't, you know, I, I don't know everything about them, um, but it seems like we tend to lean into African neighborhoods or uh, friend groups or cultures. And I think that's one thing to unpack, but I also think that it's necessary for folks of different cultures to have that super um, solidarity, right? Like, so if I, for the rest of my life, am a Pan-Africanist, like I'm okay with that. My soul feels good with that. I think my ancestors respect that. Um, and I think that's necessary to show that there is solidarity out there that can be accomplished, uh, uh, being an accomplice as opposed to being an ally. Yeah. Still unpacking that question. Right. <laughs> and, and you mentioned uh, uh, Yui Kochiyama. Uh, we, talked, we talked a little bit, bit, bit about this in our last episode about international solidarity of the role of Yuri Kochiyama as uh, alongside uh, Malcolm X. And, and also uh, mentioned the, not only the work that they had, but also the fact that they share the same born day, <laughs> as well as an, another another uh, revolutionary in Ho Chi Minh. Uh, Could you speak more about, about the role of both Ho Chi Minh and Ho Chi Minh, as well as as far as their actual solidarity and Congo's work with Africans? I think. Um... You know, usually when I do a training, I do like a land acknowledgement. And for us, that means like giving the land back, not just acknowledging that it's stolen mm -hmm. land. And I talk about how Portland is a very special place because of the Willamette and the Columbia River intersecting. It was a historical gathering place for many tribal people, not just to exchange culture, our, um, our goods, but to exchange culture and camaraderie. And so I think about that too, like, I think what the through line of solidarity looks like is a solid political analysis because overarching um, are the, the quotes that I hear most from 
uh, Yuri Koshiyama, Richard Aoki, and Grace Lee Boggs is that like we have similar struggles and it's capitalism that keeps separating us or trying to separate us from supporting each other. And so why shouldn't I be here to support African liberation? Um, and again, like for me personally, like I think my ancestors would be proud of that because of the generational like anti-blackness that are in my communities, in Chinese communities, Asian communities. Can you expound a little more on what you just said in terms of anti-blackness or uh, anti-African sentiments and actions? For sure. I know that acceptability and respectability politics were one of the main reasons that Chinese folks were able to survive. Like most of my family are on the West Coast. And um, after learning about, you know, obviously there was major hardships uh, when my people first started like emigrating here in um, like the 1830s-ish and the Chinese Exclusion Act and things like that. So it wasn't for the lack of like struggle that we didn't understand that we can unite there, but it was the intervention of uh, capitalist and imperialist forces um, that were in these systems and institutions that we were moving around in that kept us se separated. It, it makes me think about um, slave patrols and slaves, right? Are enslaved Africans, like the need to separate the proletariat or the poor and working class in order to keep them from uniting was the goal of neo-colonialism, right? And capitalism. So I see that very clearly in the ways that like Asian people, and I think specifically Chinese, Japanese, and Korean folks were able to survive because of their proximity to whiteness. I know there's like lots of neo-Nazis out there that like are kind of okay with Asian folks, but they're not okay with anybody else darker than khaki. Like we know that there's whole communities in, um, in Japan that dress up as Nazis or imperialist Japan, Japan army, like uniforms and things like that too. So I see like all of those connections kind of like fueling the separation of our communities. And like, I just don't want to stand for that. Like that, that to me is really ridiculous. Like my auntie had said like, well, we struggled too. Cause I was talking a lot about like black liberation or African liberation at the time, you know, I was using the word black, um, but I understand that African is most definitely more appropriate. And she's like, we were oppressed too. And I was like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that we got to throw other people under the bus. Like I never understood why my family would make racially prejudiced comments and not having a lot of black friends, not having a lot of Sikh friends, not having a lot of Muslim friends or anything like that. So that always made me really uncomfortable in my family. And still to this day, like they are kind people, but kind doesn't mean correct. So I try to struggle with them and bring in new language and new concepts around like, how can we unite with folks? So I got a pretty uh, racially prejudiced uncle. Um, he grew up in 1940s, 1950s in Sacramento, uh, getting picked on by uh, African folks. And so he grew up very angry about that. Um, but now he's in his like 70s and he's like been working with uh, uh, different Africans. Um, he was a pharmacist and he was working with different Africans and he's like, they're okay. <laughs> Which, you know, it, is not where we want to be, but we can see and know that when we struggle with people, like they can come to a better uh, sense of enlightenment around their prejudices. So I'm, I'm down to struggle with my family and I'm definitely down to struggle with the rest of my community um, around anti-Blackness. In what ways in your own actions and uh, those you have seen uh, organizing with you are ways one can be an accomplice in this struggle? I think talking about our mistakes, I think is really important. I often think of like Asada Shakur quote, like, you know, there are no mistakes, there are only lessons. And then I always follow that up with Kwame Ture's quote, like, you know, if I make a mistake and I don't rectify it, then I've made two mistakes. Um, so you can definitely see how Pan-Africanism definitely influenced the way that I think, because I think that that's correct. Um, so just recently I did a training, a de-escalation training, 
And we talked about like, you know, how do we de-escalate folks um, and understand our social locations while we're de-escalating? Because a lot of folks were white or European and, you know, asking about that. And I was like, full disclosure, you know, I grew up not liking black people. I, I grew up not liking Africans for these stereotypical reasons. And when I admitted that, I can feel people like, oh, that, oh, the, the visceral reaction. And I'm like, but that was a mistake. I can unlearn those things. And I think, you know, when I think about my own solidarity with, with Africans, I feel, you now Jamila and I have talked at nauseum about this, but again, like fam or kin, like family, like that stuff gets thrown around, but I'm really serious when I feel that and think about that. If I call to ancestors, I'm calling to all ancestors that are for truth and justice. And I know that the work that a lot of Pan-Africanists and a lot of Africans have done, I benefit from. And so when I realize that and I understand that and I put that into praxis, I owe a lot to the folks that came before us. And that also means like changing my own actions and struggling it out with other people to help them come to that consciousness as well. Definitely. And as I go back onto that, uh, you know, this, uh, we talked a bit about this uh, again on uh, last episode, but uh, with regards to the Palestinians, but, and also for, uh, and there, there's some uh, a skepticism or outright um, uh, denial of wanting to work with uh, with, a, with Asian uh, Asian accomplices, but we caught what is here about oh look what China's doing in Africa or look at what they, they so like some like shop owner in in my hood that they, what they're doing or or look at all, like, they always like highlight this person this and. But we're not doing like. How would you respond to uh, in in your in your organizing space? How do you respond to Africans who say, "Oh, yeah, I like I, I can trust you, or I can trust this person, but like at, like eight, like Chinese people, Japanese, like I I don't, I don't trust them." Or like, how do you how do you work against that? Uh, the first thing I say is that that's completely understandable. I understand why you have those feelings um, about my people or about people that look like me. Um, no doubt. And I actually had this conversation the other day, too, um, where I was like, so, yes, I identify as Chinese, but my people also, like, because I have a bunch of tattoos and I'm pretty outspoken about a lot of things, like, also feel like a little bit of a misfit. But this is what Chinese looks like. So they'd be happy to have me because <laughs> I know my ancestors know that I'm for truth and justice and they support that. I think what I would argue or maybe like struggle with them about is generalization. I'm like, I get that China is doing these things, but that's not all Chinese people. We understand that systems and, and institutions aren't just one person. It's a movement and it's an ideology. Um, so I would struggle with them. I would be like, I appreciate you like bringing me close. You know, my people have a lot to, to be accountable to globally and interpersonally. And like, how do we, how do we expand somebody's exposure to? Because it's necessary to be exposed to folks that are kind of combating the stereotypes or combating your feelings of reservations around like Asian folks. And of course, there's what's happening now with the Stop Asian Hate Movement. Uh, there's the um, Asian hate crimes bill that was uh, recently uh, put into the U.S. government. Um, however, there is a history of the U.S. which is very rooted in anti-Asian hate. Yes. <laughs> so uh, it's tied to labor. It's tied to capitalism as a whole. So when you're seeing a lot of these bills that are being passed around to say we need to stop Asian hate, when you're seeing uh, all of these things happening and it's tied to uh, the larger sphere of attacking China itself, where people were happy about, oh, troops are being taken out of Afghanistan, 
yes, there are private contractors still there, <laughs> but it was already noted that troops are being taken out to focus on battling China. I mean, you know, it, China isn't communist any longer, at least not in practice. I think if we're talking about like individual conversations, I think it. I think it's hard though, because like if folks bring up the coronavirus as the China virus, that that's not really something that like I choose to to have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, because I know that person's very confused. Um, but what I would say is that like, well, look look at look at the our generation. Look at people my age or younger that are Asian. Like, look at how many Asians are trying to show up now. Like, I know the Chinese Progressive Association in in San Francisco. Uh, during Pride, just before the pandemic, uh, the API contingent for the trans march was the biggest, the loudest, and the most militant. And it brought tears to my eyes because I had never seen that. I, I'm, I'm queer. I grew up um, in somewhat of a conservative household where queer wasn't a thing. And so to see that change and to actually see elders out there, uh, I'll, I'll put it up for a Pam Tao Lee um, who is an elder I went to the Philippines with, who I've marched in San Francisco with, um, and is a Chinese person, Chinese elder that I look up to, somebody who's like, I'm your Auntie Pam and I love you. So I think about those things and the way that things are shifting and shifting consciousness and being like, I, I'm not, I don't wanna tell Africans like, please wait for all of us to get conscious. Um, but understand that like we are pushing that. So uh, something that I saw come up um, during this anti-Asian hate is like the impression on our community that like there are Africans showing up for us. So what does that mean, right? We saw like the, the reinsurgence of yellow peril and black power. And I push back on that sometimes too, right? I get frustrated with my own people. I'm like, don't be posting yellow peril. Like when you know that y'all come from like privilege and like you have never met this kind of hate in your life like or if you do it's not very often or it's like microaggressions as opposed to like large systemic like I know most Chinese people don't have to worry about the police like that and so to me like I want my people to like check themselves like before you say yellow peril what has your life been like like you know if you're going to unite with African folks in the struggle, like, please be aware of how many generations we've been like, okay, right? And that's not to play the oppression Olympics, but to really understand like where we can find our privileges and leverage that for solidarity. And speaking of that, there's definitely class lines within the Asian community. So you have uh, the oceans, you have uh, Cambodians, you have people from the Philippines versus South Korea, China, you know, so, so what are those discussions you've had in terms of those class lines? That's a big one, especially being with the National Democratic Movement for the Philippines, like, you know, growing up, I kind of understood that darker Asians were not desirable. Um, I remember my parents telling me like during swimming lessons, like, make sure you wear your sunscreen. You don't want to get dark. Like, yes, we understand that as anti-blackness or anti-African sentiment. But I also feel that for like my South Asian uh, friends, cousins, comrades, too. And so there's this clear delineation. I think I said earlier around privilege, like Chinese people, Japanese people, Korean people. Um, and then you know, when I actually went to the Philippines, you cannot find a product, a household product, cleaning product that doesn't have whitening cream in it. Like dish soap has whitening cream in it. It just blows my mind. Um, I shouldn't be surprised, but it, it's very disgusting because we don't have to see that version in the United States. Yeah, so we can see how like colorism within Asian communities like is is a big deal. Like I've, I've heard the phrase like the Philippines is like the Mexico of, of Asia. And like how offensive can that be? I mean like, yes, in the sense that they were both colonized by the Spanish, but we actually know like what coded terms you actually mean by that. Um, so I think that that is definitely something that we need to 
acknowledge even like from a systemic level, uh, we know that uh, API mm, South Asian and Pacific Islander folks have the lowest graduation rates in the United States. And oh, I'm, I'm trying to put together the enormity of what Asian encompass encompasses. Like Russia is part of Asia, or India is is part of Asia. But we say like, oh, when we're let's go get Asian food tonight, you're probably thinking like, you know, Chinese or Japanese or Thai food. Like you're not thinking about Indian food. If we say Indian food, we're not, we don't mean that. We just, we just say Indian food. There's a lot of different levels of erasure there. And it's very clear to me that it is colorized, right? The darker your skin is like the less valued you are. And that, that is something that doesn't escape the Asian community at all. On a side note, I wouldn't call it an insurrection. I would call it like a bunch of yahoos trying to rush the Capitol. But did you see that somebody actually had like the South Vietnamese flag out there? Yes, I saw that. <laughs> I did not see that. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember seeing that. I was like, the South Vietnamese, like, oh, okay. Oh, oh that. Oh, you're going real hardcore, like, like, wow, anti, like, anti-communism. <laughs> wow. This is very much like Dylan Roof having the Rhodesian flag on his jacket in a funny way. Oh, that's, uh, wow. Okay, I did not see that. And, and, and one thing is funny to say, like, I read some some books about, I uh, think it was uh, uh, Douglas Valentine's uh, book, uh, The Phoenix Program, talking about the, the what the, the CIA did in Vietnam during the, uh, during the, the Vietnamese Liberation War talked about the the use of South Vietnam as uh, uh like the South Vietnam as this like the proxy to like they, oh look at these look look at how hard working they are look at these they Vietnamese they they okay, they're they're good people they they're like like strict and they're disciplined people and it also looks like like darn commies those so and such and such and it's interesting that. Like this sort of like we talked about the sort of generalizations about about Asian communities and how like as you said you talk like you, you say you talk about Asian you don't really think about someone who's someone who's Tamil or someone who's uh, Hmong or someone who's uh, um, Indonesian or 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 from something like that it, or or even like we talked about Afghanistan you don't, you don't really think Asia Afghanistan you, you just think oh it's like this uh, Muslim northeast or uh, middle east like blob or something I and mean, like, like in the media you hear a lot about uh in china you hear about like japanese like culture uh in some korea but you don't hear much like, you talk about the philippines like what what sort of things for people who want who do want office out there in the filipino uh, revolution is what what sort of things have they been battling I think that just in general, because Asians um, tend to be erased systemically for lots of different reasons, um, that one of the things that I noticed that gaining solidarity for the Philippines was difficult because a lot of people are like, what's going on with the Philippines? I thought that's just where we get our bananas or like, you know, our little, you know, uh, tchotchkes or something. And a lot of people don't know that they're, they're actually in a civil war right now. There's two warring governments. Um, according to the UN, they're in a they're in a civil war. Um, so a lot of people don't recognize like the resource stealing, and that's actually where I made that um, connection with Africa too. It's like it's the same logging mining companies that are in South Asia that are in Africa. The Canadian companies, the Japanese companies, the U.S. companies, uh, the Chinese companies, they're all doing the same thing. They're attacking indigenous people. They're stealing their land and they control all the optics for it. So I think, you know, given my only experience, I, I guess I can really say as far as culture is like U.S. or American culture um, is that. Asian folks get erased. Um, Africans are not cared for here. And so that's that makes it that much easier to, to steal from those countries 
and for the power structure, the white supremacist power structure to just keep on taking because the majority of white folks are European folks here and the folks that are economically stable enough to ignore those things will ignore those things. But have you heard people say something similar to what African people in the snakes have said? Our people have contributed to building this country. This is our country. So for instance, you know, building the railroads on the, re on the West Coast. So have you heard folks say that at all in terms of um, being colonized and supporting an American identity? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I think Andrew Yang um, cannot stop running at the mouth uh, around like, but we are Americans. And, you know, to be completely honest, I did have to research a little bit about the Asian hate bill because like I get really annoyed when people are like, just vote it better. Just like, just vote and it'll get better. Or all the Asian American or Chinese American. I'm like, can we just drop the American part? Like, do you, do you all like, I understand you're very confused, but it's also really annoying to see people our colonized minds continue to imbue themselves with this lie or this charade about like, but if we're just more American, we'll survive. If we can just prove to them that we're American, like it'll be okay. It's not, it's not at all. And so I think I have a hard time watching that, that stuff because I'm like, y'all are confused. You, you think that you can assimilate into American ideology, but that's white supremacy and y'all aren't white. So that's just not gonna work. And, and, and speaking of this sort of uh, assimilation uh, or or like planting or playing people against each other, like there's been like at times there's a tendency to sort of play different parts of of like, or for like for Africans like to play sort of Af like African immigrants coming into the snakes or coming into like some like uh, imperialist nation and think oh look at how well they're doing that compared to the Africans there and they we talked a little bit about the they you know, like class, the class and racial basis as far as you know, like separation of different Asian populations. Is that I? How can people understand it? Not just as a matter of, as like for example, of like someone who's Chinese or Japanese, like uh, saying something negative about like the Philippines versus like actual like the actual like imperial history of like certain parts of Asia. I feel like two of the things that you're touching on on is self hate the denial of culture and community like I my first well my first girlfriend girlfriend in high school was Filipino and she had told me she had gone back and she's like it's dirty there I don't like it and I thought I felt really strange about that and I couldn't quite put my finger on it at the time you know like 15 year old in high school I'm not exactly woke but I am like I'll fight for something just I just am not entirely sure what it is so I remember her saying that, like, I went back to the Philippines and it's dirty. And I'm like, you know, really talk about your people like that? Like, and are we stopping to think why these countries are impoverished? And I think that that's kind of where it stops is that we don't want to think about it or capitalism has trained us to ignore the plight of other people. So, you know, when people say like, oh, I'm not political, I don't like talking about politics. What they're really saying is that I don't want to engage with the, the actual reality of where I get my privileges and my resources. And I know that we can't boycott everything that is problematic. There's no ethical consumption under capitalism. I'm sure you've said that many, many times on this show. But what it really gets us to do is just be conscious about it. Like when I look at my coffee cup, I'm like, okay, yeah, it's organic or is it fair trade or like even those things like you have to pay out the nose for. So yeah, there is no ethical consumption, but the more that we engage with how these systems and institutions like affect and inform our lives, we become more and more conscious and we live more simply that way. I think that's how I, at least I get to it. It's like, I don't need you know, all these fancy things to survive because I wanna be with the people and the majority of people don't have access to these resources. And when I really think about it, I don't want to, when I look at that chocolate bar 
and I know that it comes from Ghana and I know who's picking the chocolate and I know they've never had chocolate before and they have no idea why they're picking these things. And so it makes me think twice about that. So people feel guilty because they've done something wrong. Like, I don't want to shame anybody, but you should feel guilty when you do something wrong. <laughs> On that note with the connection, because people talk from a cultural perspective when it comes to Asian and African solidarity, if you will. So, you know, the Chinese spots in the hood, you know, that's probably the biggest cultural connection between Africans and Asian folks. But what you were talking about, mining of materials for devices, for instance, the coltan, when people say, I don't have any connection to Africa, you do, it's the device you're using. That is one of the primary connections that you have. And then you have the labor in China and labor in other Asian countries where people are not, they're hardly paid. So those are two, in my view, connections uh, between Asians and Africans that could definitely be discussed more. I definitely think you're right. Um, I think about the fashion industry and the amount of pollution and resources that go into like fashion and what, what they call fast fashion. I guess there's like lingo for that now. And when I think about that, I think about where do all our t-shirts that we can't sell or that go to Goodwill, where, where do they go? We know where they go. They get dumped in Africa somewhere with things that nobody else wants for just the same way they do in the Philippines, like buying other people's trash. The government makes you go through it, try to pick out what you can. Like, so my trash is going directly into impoverished countries and neighborhoods for them to live off of. And if we said it like that, you wouldn't buy that shirt at H&M. Well, I would hope not, right? So I think that there's there's other connections there too, um, not only with the level of oppression and who's stealing what from who, um, and it's the same companies, right? But also, you know, who, who set up the hood the way they set up the hood? Like there's also gentrification, there's also uh, gerrymandering and the dissolvement of traditional or indigenous, in, uh, ways of building a city or a township, right? Where we forget about communalism, we forget about like supporting each other. And, and I think another, I was, thinking, I was thinking of another way in which Africans and Asians uh, work together as far as um, one of the books that, one book that we read for our anti patriarchy, uh, I mean, anti patriarchy work study was a fighting to colonialisms, talking about the fight of Africans in Guinea-Bissau against the against Portuguese colonialism, as well as uh, uh, women fighting against patriarchy from both uh, the Portuguese as well as uh, indigenous uh, well, indigenous cultures. And I also think about how they, this, uh, and we talked about this sort of self-hate, and this kind of also applies to thinking about, oh, I'm so glad to be here in let's say United States, the snakes or England or, England or France where oh, we res or respect women here. Like, like we don't, we don't have to deal with patriarchy or like not, not like, not like in Africa, not like in Asia, not like, so like how, how do you, like what ways can you know, like Africans who, Africans, Asians work together, not all like is solid against um, capitalism and perils, but also against patriarchy. I think about that, just the ways that, um... So Ajamu told me something, uh, he, he was going on a trip to Ghana with other Africans that had never been. And one of them was nervous to go back because of the propaganda around how they tell uh, Africans in the United Snakes, you know, Africa doesn't want you there. Like you don't, you don't belong there. And Ajamu was saying like, actually, no, you realize that, you know, our culture is the same. We, we talk the same, we move the same, like, you'll feel at home. And so when she got off the plane, she saw like other Africans, like she couldn't understand the language, but she's like, they're loud just like me. Are they laughing just like me? Are they moving just like me? And found that like connection. So when I think about the ways that our cultures keep our traditions is pretty apparent 
both of our cultures value family unit, right? Family unity. We value education. We value bettering ourselves and each other. Um, and I think that those are core values for most any indigenous cultures. And especially when we learn more about our ancestors, we learn more about the where we've come from, we can actually understand and see how traditional ways of being were anti-patriarchal, anti-colonial, they were uh, more egalitarian, they were uh, more of an equal or exchange. I also think about like the Philippines having in traditional cultures having a minimum of five different recognized genders. Actually Thailand right now has five different recognized genders where you know we can see the colonial binary, the influx of like missionaries and Christianity really clouding that as like, nope, there's just two genders, there's men and there's women, when really we know that human beings are much more dynamic than that. And if we look back and we reach back into our traditional ways of being, we understand um, how to really hold humanity and how to see humanity instead of um, the way that capitalism and imperialism has made us like separate and wanting for for things that are not uniting that aren't about family and about community let's talk about ho chi minh for a moment <laughs> so, uh, speaking of uh, african and asian solidarity he spent some time in the snakes as well he began studying and looking into garveyism he also was inspired by the injustices happening to Africans as a whole, as a move to move towards liberation for the Vietnamese people. You mentioned South Vietnam and Vietnam currently is being made to pay uh, for fighting for liberation is very similar to Haiti, having to pay the French. <laughs> the, the French are involved in a lot of things right now. So actually, just on a side note, Macron recently apologized for what happened in Rwanda. And then there's a, you know, Europe's also apologizing for what happened in Namibia. Uh, so there is sort of this apology tour on behalf of Europe right now. People still continue to honor Ho Chi Minh. But as a whole, do you think Ho Chi Minh will be, I don't know if honored is the right word, but acknowledged by the West, similar to how Martin Luther King Jr. is acknowledged. Do you think, you know, how they acknowledge Haiti in some way where they're like, oh, uh, you know, this project or that project, or, you know, still not honoring Aristide, but saying, okay, January 1st, there was the Haitian revolution. Do you think in some cavalier way, Ho Chi Minh and or the struggle for North Vietnamese liberation will be honored. Whether it's cavalier, whether it's sincere, do you think that will be a reality? I'm trying not to laugh out loud. I <laughs> expecting any imperialist country, even like imperialist light like Canada, Canada, like I would never expect them to acknowledge true revolutionaries and really like talk about what they were about. We know that like MLK is used to further the capitalist agenda and the neocolonialist agenda. Um, a lot of the things that um, were most radical about his life were at the end, right? You know, the Beyond Vietnam speech I think is way more important than the I Have a Dream speech, but is often ignored and not talked about and looked at. So I would not expect any imperialist government, especially like the United States, to acknowledge Ho Chi Minh, uh, Arthan Al Thak, with any kind of honors outside of like, he was a scholar. Maybe that's it. I wouldn't expect anything like that. It, you know, Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister, I think just recently made an apology. I forgot to which country because I'm just like your your apology means absolutely nothing. Yeah, you can you can send Namibia um, 1.2 million dollars, but that's nothing. That is nothing compared to what you have done. It's kind of a tangential, but when I think about, you know, trying to have uh, a balanced dialectical look at how I treat European folks, whether they're ignorant, whether they're woke, what whatnot, 
I remember that I don't necessarily always have to have patience for that when I get angry about what they're saying, because I think about how many Africans, how many uh, Mexicans, how many indigenous people, uh, of course, uh, Mexicans in the United States are indigenous. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, how many people never got to thrive? Generations of folks that never got to see another generation, never got to like millions and maybe even billions of folks that never got to be and live a full life because of colonization and the choices that imperialists made. I don't have a lot of sympathy sometimes for like European folks who are just like clueless. Your apology means absolutely nothing because you cannot bring back the generations or the billions of people that never got to live a full life. You can't even acknowledge that the people, their descendants that are here are not living a full life. Yeah, I, that one that one is pretty easy. I, I, I would laugh if, if it was any more than an apology, you know. Uh, in terms of reparations, uh, that is a huge issue. Uh, there were um, depopulation programs for Asian communities in this country, um, labor camps, uh, internment camps, and people are like, well, Asian people got reparations. Would you consider what happened reparations? <clears throat> I, I guess it depends on what it's relative to. In general, no. But I don't think that that's the way that we necessarily like became acceptable. You know, I, I think it's because I have a hard time imagining what like a liberated idea of what reparations would be. Because I know that there's folks fighting for reparations and it's not just money, right? It's, it's space, it's time, it's education, it's um, community building and fortifying and things like that and trying to regain some sense of like power and autonomy over themselves and the communities. Um, but before you finish, I'm gonna say the only true reparations for Africans is Africans getting African back. So that's what I'll say to that. Okay, continue. Love that. <laughs> I appreciate that uh, you probably recognize that a lot of the things that I say are, are very party focused, uh, are things that I've heard from the party because it's just true. It is just true. And I love the way that you all like hold your line and say the things that you say. So that makes total sense to me that a true reparations is uh, a free Africa that in which the African people control the continent. Yeah, reparations are, uh, I don't spend a lot of time there because I'm like, there's nothing that you can do to bring back or make up for what you've done. Right on, and and also, also when you talk when you talk about the all like how oh they got reparation oh they have reparations for this and this, but you know you don't hear about the fact that how uh, Cambodia allowed they have like still have like millions of tons of explosives like on like, like undetonated explosives or landmines or you know hear about like the vast amount of like the cancer the cancer from the like, age orange and other chemical weapons you don't hear about like, or even, like what's happening in west papua the 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 hundreds of thousands of deaths uh like from the indonesian government supported by uh imperialist powers as well as like local it's like australia and and and, and the thing goes goes back to what we were talking about before with the sort of the individualizing of individualizing propaganda how like you you'd, like we have this like long history of of imperialism of and of patriarchal uh, religious and so on um exploitation oppression of of much of Asia, but they, but when you see on the news, it's like the typical, oh, it was a black, oh, an African did this, or an African hit this. Like how, how do you combat that, that propaganda? I, I think I, I tried to come at it from, again, like, you know, please don't generalize, right? Like, you know, we can't generalize what one person does for the rest of everybody else, or else we would say like all Germans are Nazis, right? That's not true. I, you know, I think earlier I said something to the effect of like, 
yeah, like, don't you think that African folks would be angry with the amount of anti-Blackness that are, that's in our communities? I'm not saying it's okay, but we have to understand, like, I think it's hard because sometimes I'll try to argue and try to help this person understand like African struggle. And I don't even fully understand African struggle, I'm not African. Um, but understanding like the many different barriers or obstacles that folks have to go through just to survive. You don't have to think about those things. That's why you just see it as black and white. Oh, well, those like two races are fighting each other right now. And when I think about like my family too, there's like a lot of, again, like anti-African sentiment where I'm just like, but that's not everybody. Like, you know this, like you probably have like African coworkers and friends that you know are people that you would respect. And like, I just don't believe, and I don't think that you should be using that mechanism to the mechanism of generalization to poison your idea of like a whole host of people, <laughs> an entire continent, Africans everywhere. Like, how can you say that? Like, you don't know, do you, I guess the question I asked is like, do you know every African? <laughs> no? Okay, well, there we go then. Let's discuss your experience with community defense because you are one of the biggest proponents I know. Obviously, there's Ajamu Umi, Comrade Ajamu, yes. And I'm going to keep saying it, Ajamu is actually the one who recruited me into the AAPRP. I went to an African Liberation Day. I said, I'm joining the party. He was the one who took me and I will forever be grateful for that. <laughs> but um, I have organized with you and we have done community defense together. What does that mean to you? Because that is a, a huge component of our liberation is when the masses end up doing community defense against these opposing, these oppressive forces. So what's your experience with that? How did you come to know community defense? And how did you come to uh, live community defense? I think you live it. So I, I think that's the best word to say. Thank you. I, I try very much to live it. So community defense to us and the way that we build the structure is that we know that our safety and liberation is contingent on one another. Um, I kind of use the example of like a neighbor, right? Like you might not like your Trumpy neighbor, but you share space and you're accountable to the safety there. So how do you negotiate that? Or another way to think about it is like the jackass through the minefield, like jackass is just going to wander and get blown up. So we got to carry his dumb ass through the minefield or even COVID, right? Like a lot of people are like, uh, even on the left, they're like, oh, let those conservatives get sick and get Corona. Like we don't need them anyways. And I'm like, that's not really honoring humanity, first of all. Second of all, like I got a lot of friends that work in the hospitals and I don't want them to be constantly uh, inundated or like overworked for the next like year and a half. So I think there's folks that are like very reactive <laughs> and there's folks that kind of sit and think about like, what's the bigger picture and trying to struggle with that. Like, you know, right now I work with um, C3PO and it's, I'm so bad with this particular acronym, but it's community creating communities for folks living outside. I totally got that wrong. But anyways, um, there's three houses, uh, camps that we're working with and they're using a village model where there's very little intervention from housed folks and uh, we're trying to leave it up to the village to decide like you know their protocols and their things like that which I think is kind of difficult when you've got so many basic needs that are not being met it's kind of hard to think about like organizing right so um, that's how we try to uh, confront or engage with community defense with our safety and liberation and knowing that it's contingent on one another. So I always, always, always hammer down that like community defense is literally common unity. So how do we unite with each other? How do we support each other? How do we respect each other's humanity? How do we build? How do we struggle? How do we struggle with each other? 
Um, I tell people all the time, like, I really love criticism, especially when it's coming from a principled place. A lot of people are like, that's weird. And I'm like, it's not because it gives me an opportunity to address the things that are problematic in my behavior, um, that I can change them and I can do better. So I can become a better person if we just criticized each other a little bit more or had a culture in which we were able to do that. I also like train in martial arts and I uh, train in other things. And a lot of people are always interested in like physical self-defense tools. I don't, I guess I don't have to fill those blanks in for you. You can imagine what some of those might be. Um, But I always say like the strongest level of safety is community. I would rather go out with five of my closest comrades than by myself with a huge rifle or lots of ammunition. Because to me, that doesn't address the problem. Here I, I'm thinking about Audrey Lord. You cannot dis, uh, dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. And again, I use that, that analogy too. I'm like, we cannot allow um, our detractors, our, our enemies, our systems of oppression to take our humanity. We have to see each other in humanity. I use, the, I use this example sometimes in my de-escalation classes. I say, well, you know, say I punched a Nazi in the face and he's bleeding, but he's, you know, crying about how he has to pick up his young daughter later. His level of hatred was learned, number one. Number two, his ideology, his ideology is my enemy. And that enemy is not going to take away my ability to see him as a human being. And I know that might be very controversial for all my anarchist friends, but that doesn't mean I'm going to like, you know, patch him up and send him on his way. But it could mean that like uh, how I view violence, how I'm able to process that. I talk about uh, the difference between self-defense and violence. A lot of people get those two things very confused. If somebody's, you know, trying to hurt you and you're trying to defend yourself, that's defense. So what if you had to punch him in the face to defend yourself? That's self-defense. It's not violence. So we have to also apply those things to like bigger systemic issues. To me, community defense is the most important part of safety. Without that, what, what do we have? None of us got here on our own. And it's the relationships Okay, I'm going to give Kent Ford uh, of the or, uh, Portland chapter of the Black Panthers Party. He, he told us this. Um, it is the relationships that you build um, that are the most important organizing tool. The strong relationships that you build are the most important organizing tool. Never forgotten that. Um, Ajamu, that's something that Ajamu says too. So... I 100% believe that because if you don't have like a tight knit group or folks that have, have your back, then what do you have? A bunch of things work. Uh, What vacations? Is that fulfilling? Does that fulfill our souls? I guess that, that might be the question. And one of the hardest components about organizing is building relationships. You're going to be rejected a lot. That's that from family, from people you thought were friends, those things are going to happen. The whole thing about building an analysis is knowing how to handle that. And so that is also having a process of criticism. You talked about criticism. Um, All of these things are aspects of how to deal with that as opposed to being reactionary and building community defense, building that network of people. You can't have that unless you build relationships. So that is why it's the hardest part. Because when you talk about your line, people are going to go, well, I ain't got nothing to do with no Africa. I ain't got nothing to do with this. Oh, but capitalism's not bad. It's just crony capitalism. Or we just need more Black business and then we'll be okay. So you're going to have a lot of defense of capitalism and saying, well, communism, all this uh, Marxism claptrap or whatever, you know. Um, So you're gonna see a lot of rationalizations for capitalism, but if you're principled and you continue to do the work, in the end, build relationships. And when you go door to door, building relationships with people and talking about what your objective is, people are gonna go, oh, free education? Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, free education is cool, free 
uh, medical services, that's cool. Just basic material needs, people generally agree with, unless your class interest is in capitalism. So again, when you have your line and you're building relationships based on that line, you're gonna see that community defense. And, and, and going along, like if you talk about a his, history of people, like, they, with, they, it's definitely this uh, prop, uh, push to like suppress this history of all the such so that we were talking about you know, Ho Chi Minh and the UNA and Chama and Max also. They even even like talk about uh Robert F. Williams, who's like, like if you think like for Africans we think about black power, like you can't, you can't much about obviously talk about Kwame Ture, but also like someone like Robert F. Williams, if you think, oh like, Robert F. Williams had the gun, the Uyghurs with guns and so on. But like, you you went to not only you went to Cuba to set up the uh, Radio Free Dixie, but also went to China, like, you know, maybe with um, Mao Zedong, and but you don't you don't hear that. <laughs> and we want to talk about, uh, you want to talk about uh, Gabriella and Akpayan, like, uh, what what sort of um, what sort of uh, projects have they done that they, they've been a part of? Um, <clears throat> I think the most recent project that I was a part of, at least like one of the more national ones was like bringing um, some indigenous tribes. So in the Philippines, there's 18 confederated uh, tribes and they uh, call themselves the Lumad. Um, of course, there's more indigenous tribes. Some of them aren't like within that confederation, um, but they had done a tour around the US to stop the killings. There was a you know, when is there not a, a, a rise in killings in the Philippines? This is really hard um, to to confront, but especially for like indigenous people, like the amount of paperwork and things that they have to do in order to even prove that, you know, they have this, uh, the, the land. So this tour was going around to, I think, five different stops in the U.S., like New York, Chicago, uh, Seattle, Portland, L.A., um, and talking about, like, ending the killings of, like, indigenous people, specifically the Lumad. It was one of their um, projects. I think if I'm trying to link specifically, like, like, African solidarity with the Philippines or the ways that, like, this movement is in support of Africa, it's kind of hard to say. I think that, you know, the direct work that the ND orgs are doing or to liberate um, the Philippines and to support the Filipino people. And that is also like how they see their contribution to worldwide liberation and African liberation. Um, there is a lot of Mm, there is collaboration among those organizations and um, different African organizations, um, but primarily um, Anik Bay and Gabriella are very much focused on the Philippines um, from that perspective. And again, since I am not an official representative of the ND movement anymore, I just wanted to like caveat that because um, there might be other things that are on the, on the plate that I don't necessarily see. There was uh, an instance where the Oregon chapter was going home and Gabriella contributed financially to that. So that is one mode of solidarity out of many in terms of Gabriella. I'll just say that. For sure. I think I, I've seen and known of a lot of like collaborations between Gabriella specifically um, and I think the the AAWRU, the Women's Union. Um, and I think that's a very strong and important um, relationship that I saw foster here in Portland. Um, Gabriella, as a militant Filipinos um, women's organization, um, very much uh, is akin to the AAWRU. So to me, like, that's really, really cool to see, um, actually, is that level of solidarity. Um, and I know that in the Bay Area, Anik Bayan um, East Bay works a lot with the party, too. So I know that there's that solidarity. I've seen um, party members in San Jose at some of these, like, um, at some of the ND events. So that was always good to see party members everywhere we go. 
I do want to ask you a question about the quote Asian community. Obviously, the Asian community is not monolithic, but the Asian community and policing. And there was obviously there were a few instances um, police either uh, shot or shot at, and more specifically, uh, Asian police officers. Um, having a hand in a uh, state sanctioned violence. So of course, there was uh, Peter Liang who shot uh, Akai Gurley. And then you have, of course, with George Floyd where the anniversary of his murder recently happened, but there was a uh, Tao Tao. So the relationship between police and Asian communities, uh, I think, that relationship, uh, particularly in the 90s, solidified perhaps in LA <laughs> uh, where there were shootings that happened. And so there was the shooting of Latasha Harlins in the store. The cop of Asian descent who just sat there and watched George Floyd be murdered. And so there was, uh, I'm not sure why there was a lot of conflicted conversation. It's a cop sitting there watching someone be murdered for almost 10 minutes. So what are your thoughts around policing and the quote Asian community? Again, I'm saying this in quotes. And also, and also made me think of another when um forget, forget the, the cop's name that was uh that was um that was killed uh, that was shot in uh right here in Few years ago, and there was a, I know there was a lot of, I think it was a, a lot of Chi like a Chinese uh, support for, a, a, for the cop because of oh our lives matter too, and and this sort of conflation of, of that again that sort of conflation between oh identifying of some ethnic background versus identifying a class background, and that's another point I want to add to something. <laughs> Yeah, I think that is also like pretty complicated too. And I am in no way, shape or form like an expert on those particular things. I think maybe that is because I feel kind of a deep shame when I see like, like other Asians involve themselves in fascist behaviors. I do, I do think about like, you know, South Asian gangs, but I'm also like, okay, but what did the U.S. government do to their countries that they had to emigrate here and live in poverty and try to protect themselves and so on and so forth? Um, and but before, I just, you, before you continue, oh, yeah. I think the cop's name is Wenjian Liu, the, the cop who was shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think I there was another police officer that I can remember in Sacramento um, that was killed, I, another... I think he was Asian too. And they put like the community came together and put up like $40,000 or something like that to find his killer. And I'm just like, man, what a waste of money. Um, I'm kind of, I know. Right. Um, I, I have that same kind of, I, I get pretty salty about it because I really hate seeing my people or like proximity thereof involving themselves in uh, fascist behavior and like doing the work for the state. Um, same with the US military, like I don't actually feel great about the first South Asian like fighter jet pilot that was just um, celebrated recently. And even like the trans ban on the military, I'm like, so what? I don't want like I'm trans. I don't want my people getting like killed and I don't want my people like killing other like poor and brown people. Like there's that lack of, you know, analysis for folks. And I used to be pro military until one of my friends questioned me and was like, yeah, but do they really do good? And I'm like, I actually didn't know. I didn't know I was blindly following or excuse me, that's ableist. I was just uh, following that without any like evidence or analysis to back it up. So I think there's a lot of folks in my community that, you know, I think of my family in particular where they don't think about the analysis of one of us or one of our people. They just think like, okay, well, this is my life now. So whatever, 
the United States snakes consider like success, that means that we're successful. So I, I try to push back on that and being like, well, what does that really mean? Because like, you know, when I think about my ancestors and how our people used to be, it was communal. It was the focus of like, how can we make sure that everybody's eaten? How can we make sure that everybody lives a full life? Um, and it isn't like making money and buying things. And I, and I see that disconnect, but yet like my family tells me that like, I'm not Chinese enough right like oh you're a banana and i'm like what do you mean by that like just because i don't speak the language or just because i'm not like ethnocentric like and i know that like obviously not all chinese people are but i, I think a lot of folks in the states are when you know when i reference like acceptability and respectability politics like you just don't want to admit that your proximity to whiteness is why you are quote unquote successful and why would i want to be successful in a system that subjugates you know more than half the population when you put it like that to my family, they don't like talking to me anymore. So I have to find different ways to struggle with them. But it's pretty obvious to me, like, why would we want to be traditional when that's hurting other peoples? And therein lies a conversation about the model minority myth that people somehow love to uphold uh, when it comes to, well, um, these immigrants, are opening stores and they're gaining upward mobility. What's wrong with you? Why are you killing each other? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing, why don't you pull yourself up by the bootstraps? Once again, that comes with the class lines where folks from South Korea are favored or China, et cetera, where you know, people from the Philippines tend to work lower wage jobs unless they're nurses or they're in the military. Uh, and you have, again, people from Vietnam, people from Cambodia work lower wage jobs versus those model minorities who are favored. And so again, we come back to class in this conversation. We come back to labor in this conversation when people are talking about the model minority myth and the access to education, the access to particular jobs, the access to housing, the access to all of these things that are being praised by the system which controls the myth of the model minority. Yeah, it also makes me think about like, you know, not to get like so woo woo, but um, it makes me think about generational trauma, right? It's something that I've been really kind of like sitting with generational trauma, historical trauma, the level of denial in these communities. Um, I had a conversation with my aunt and uncle. My uncle is European. My aunt is Chinese. And I was talking about the concentration camps that Japanese people were put in during World War II. And they have a lot of Japanese friends. They run around with like Chinese and other Asian associations. And they're like, well, my friends that were in the camp said it wasn't that bad. I'm like, first of all, that's a small sample size. Second of all, we have so much data and documentation about the horrific things that happened to people in those camps, let alone like all the things that were taken from them to be put in those places. And my uncle's response, he's the European one, just to remind you, uh, he said, well, why would they lie to us? And my first response was dignity. But now that I'm sitting here with y'all, I'm thinking like that's generational trauma. I think something that seems very traditional to me in, from, you know, being raised Chinese and around Chinese people is that we swallow our sorrow for the next generation. And that's actually not to get too personal. One of the reasons why, like, I don't want to have children myself, but I'm willing to raise like the village, like the children in the other parts of the village is that, you know, I will mistakenly, like pass down my generational trauma and I want it to stop with me. I want to be able to work on that. I want to make my ancestors proud and I want to put my work into other folks and other babies that are already out there that need my support. Um, Cause I know that like just two parents isn't enough. That's how like indigenous communities worked, right? Collect collectiveness. There's lots of people watching all the kids like that. That's always been supported. So yeah, I think if people knew that, you know, 
people in the Philippines, people in Japan have to like pay for their classes or there's so much pressure to be quote unquote successful academically that the suicide rates are actually pretty, um, pretty high and, and uncomfortable. I think even one suicide over not getting good grades is uncomfortable. And in the Philippines, they have to pay for their tests. So if they're impoverished and they fail their tests, like that's maybe a week worth of meals right there. The model minority keeps us separated it's a way that capitalism tries to put a carrot in front of people and in different in different ways in institutions in systems so we keep fighting amongst each other we keep blaming each other and instead of the systematic ills right like our biggest enemy is not a human being, it's an ideology. It's the ideology of capitalism or imperialism. And speaking of that, I think another connection between African and Asian communities is land. Again, you had the struggle in Vietnam, it was a fight for land. You have countries all over Africa, it's a struggle for the fight for land. The Philippines is a struggle for the fight for land. And I think that's the th the thing we need to understand, power is land. So if we understand that and come together and have solidarity, it's gonna be very powerful, <laughs> very, very powerful. Absolutely. I met um, a man from the Manobo tribe in the Philippines and he said, if I don't live in my land, if I don't have access to my ancestral land, if I live in the city, I am no longer Manobo. And that really hit me because, you know, we've, we've talked about land is, is power, but how does that really manifest itself? And what do you mean by that? You have control over the resources and you get to decide where they go and who gets to benefit from them and how people get to benefit from them. That's a discussion. That's the discussion that we need to be having. Absolutely. And are there any final words for this episode you would like to say <laughs> oh man put me on the spot for sage words um i just really appreciate being here uh from the bottom of my heart i just uh love the party so much um not putting any uh anybody on a pedestal but um without y'all and without uh, certain um, members that, that I've worked with, I would not be here today. So to me, like, I know that I owe my life and safety uh, to a lot of party members and to a lot of your ancestors and elders. So I wanna just say that a deep appreciation um, for you all. And I know that one of the things that I am going to do for the rest of my life in honor of uh, African solidarity is that I'm gonna take care of myself so I can give this system health for as long as I can. Um, I'm so glad so glad to have you here and so glad to have this conversation. Got me really fired up. And, and hopefully hopefully, whenever, whenever you are over here on the East Coast and the snakes that we all, all give them hell. <laughs> I hope to uh, eventually meet you in, in person in real three one day, Evan. Thank you. I would love to see. Mm -hmm. And Jamila, what a present. This was a present. This is like the best part of my day to get you to, to see your face and, and to actually interact with you. I'm just so good to see you. Love you so much, Janet. <laughs> love oh. you so much. We will forever be in that struggle together for liberation. We will be free, even if it's not in our lifetime, but we know this work we're doing is gonna guarantee our liberation. And I am so happy to be doing that with you. Right back at you. Oh, I love you so much, family. Forward you. ever. Forward. Backwards, never. <laughs>